speaker, Jean. And is Jean with us? Hey, Jean, how are you? You're on mute, Jean, the buzzword of the last 12 months. Oh, there I am. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. You're joining us from San Fran. Is that is that right? Uh, yes, that is true. Well, welcome aboard and thank you for being part of the event. Uh, so, Jean, I'm sure you'll introduce yourself, but let me give you a bit of a push. Uh, so, Jean, uh, she's the founder and CEO of Akita Software. Uh, we've built a, an API-centric observability platform. So Jean has a bit of a, an intimidating pedigree, actually, within academic, uh, academia, like being a professor of computer science, which does sound uh, very, very fancy. Uh, uh, professor of computer science. Not okay. as fancy as it sounds. <laughs> it does sound fancy. I'll, I'll give you that. And a PhD, to make things worse, uh, on top of that, a PhD from uh, MIT. Um, and I'm aware that you were selected as one of MIT's uh, technology reviews, like 35 innovators under 35, which is something. Um, and stalking you online, just so I could introduce you, I noticed that you'd written an essay, the, the Case for Developer Experience, which I suspect a lot of the crew here, um, the audience, will be interested in. Maybe you touch upon it or maybe they can connect with you after to ask you about that. Yeah, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on um, the new age of developer experience. Good one. Well, all over to you, Jane. Uh, have fun. Thank you. Um, okay, so hi, everyone. I'm Jean, and I'm, I'm giving this talk live, so I'd love to hear from you in the chat. Um, in fact, I, I don't know how many are watching live, but let's experiment. Give me a shout out in the, in the chat if you're here, and I will give the talk to you. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Um, and uh, this talk is going to be about a new way to think about API specifications. And in fact, I've gotten in many fights about whether this should be even called specifications anymore. So I would, I would love to hear from you about this. Um, so uh, as, as a founder of a developer tools company, I talk to a lot of software teams and a uh, big motivation for why we're doing what we do is we hear from teams over and over again. We try to be good about writing specs, but, oh, he saw in the chat. See, I'm paying attention to the chat. Um, we often don't know what our systems will do until prod. And so, you know, people say there's, you design, you write a spec, you do all this stuff. And then um, in effect, uh, teams are just testing in prod. And so um, a big motivation for this talk is that API first remains elusive for many. So uh, on the left is a graph from Postman State of the API. And what it shows is that despite the appeal of API first, only a small fraction of companies are actually fully API first. And a lot of companies are somewhat API first. So one explanation is everyone else is just getting there. Uh, I offer up another explanation, which is that API first doesn't quite fit the pace of modern development, but with some tweaks, we can make it work. And so this talk is really about what's a model that works better. And so this talk is about bridging the gap between design first and implementation first, or why the rise of SaaS and APIs uh, doesn't mean, oh, sorry, that's a typo, specifications have become meaningless. So the first part is about why specifications have gone out the window in this new age of software development. And yes, Ben, this is um, this is very much what I talk about in my blog post, uh, the case for developer experience. Uh, then I'll propose a new way of existing from API first to API in the loop. Uh, API first is a subset of in the loop because, you know, you, it's there too. Um, and then I'll talk about some of what we've been working on at Akita um, that, you know, we're also not the only ones working on this kind of thing, but one way to get after the fact specs um, to meet uh, testing and production and modern development where it is. 
All right. So before I go on a little bit about me, I, I guess Ben actually covered most of this. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. But um, I was previously working on um, programming languages, program analysis, designing programming languages, designing analyses, designing type systems, that kind of thing. Um, essentially, what I realized is that there are huge gaps in understanding software at the level of the API graph. And so any application level tool really covers such a small part of the, of the whole system. And so um, I spent a bunch of time learning a lot about the technical and non-technical pain points software teams have around APIs and software understanding. And then um, I decided one-click API-based observability, what we're doing at Akita, is the way to go. And so this talk is a lot about the lessons um, around APIs I learned there. And so... Let's start. And so if, if there are any comments you have during this talk, please feel free to shout out in the chat. I, uh, I have a separate laptop that I'm using to, to look at the chat because because uh, I can't see it on the on the same window. So if you if you say something, I will see it. Um, but this first part is about why specs have gone out the window. And so if you're at this conference, it's probably because you're a fan of SaaS and APIs, you've seen the benefits of SaaS and APIs, and you recognize how they've made it easier than ever to add functionality to your system. You need uh, payments, you need uh, SMS, there's an API for that. Uh, but what it means is that building and shipping has shifted to operating software components so instead of having these um, really well-defined, planned, um, tightly controlled environments where um, people can understand all parts of what's going on in software, software has become this organically evolving graph where you have different functionality coming in and out at different times. And so what has happened is testing now happens in production. A lot of the time, um, it's impossible to know exactly how everything fits together until you are in the place where it all fits together. And intended behavior is often based on observed behavior now, because what your system uh, does, if it depends on all this stuff in production, it's really hard to, to say up front what things are going to do. And so um, a big consequence of this is that the software development life cycle, as we know it, has died. So uh, what used to involve planning, analysis, design, implementation, testing, and integration, uh, and then maintenance, um, has now shrunk down to uh, implementation, testing, and integration, and then a lot of maintenance. Uh, what's happened is that design is less top-down and more organic than ever before, and testing has decreased in scope. And so um, one big way I started noticing this was um, because I was teaching university students computer science, I realized that what we were teaching was actually quite far off from what people did in industry because we would tell people, well, you know, you should debug with a debugger, not print F. And in practice, especially if you're working with a large distributed system, lots of APIs, you're debugging with logs. And we tell students use type checkers, linters, other analyzers to help you catch preventable errors before running your code. These often don't exist across your APIs. And we also tell students, test your code on small examples before running the whole thing. Uh, now the best we have is principled testing in prod. And I'm not saying it's bad, it's great. It's the very rational response to what we're doing, but maybe we can get a little bit further back. Uh, to have some of these niceties of, uh, of programming. And so given all this, it's not surprising that API specs, API documentation, all of this remains elusive. So um, according to the Smart Bear survey, only 35% of API providers feel their organization's API documentation is above average. And, um, you know, back when we used to get briefed on uh, university orientation. They would say, you know, all the students, uh, parents think their kids are above average. So if it's only 35%, it's really not many. Um, and it makes sense because the rise of SaaS and APIs makes it possible to drift from designs faster than ever before. The complexity of software behavior makes it difficult for developers to understand intended behavior, let alone plan and document it. And the fact that APIs are now products and the fact that products are in constant conversation with users mean that they're going to evolve a lot. 
And so we're left with the question, okay, so, you know, API first is many good things. What is the future of that? And my answer is you don't have to throw API first away. Uh, you can just shift it to API in the loop. So um, here's the tension. Software is this uh, organically evolving rainforest. So service-oriented, API-oriented development have made it possible to add and remove functionality uh, as individual teams find appropriate. This is great. Teams can move fast. It's amazing. And there's no need to consult a central authority to do any of it. So architects before had a lot more say, and this is what's going on. Now they're kind of like, all right, here's process, go forth. And each service and API can accommodate and adapt to whoever shows up, which is also great for moving fast. But the problem is that APIs often need to be these planned gardens. So developers need to know how to call an API and what behavior to expect, because that's the product they're using. Product managers, documentation writers, and the rest of the team need to know what they're working with. And developers and team members alike need to know when an API changes, because um, if I'm a developer and, I, and I'm using Sendbird, as we saw in the last talk, or Twilio or Stripe and my, uh, my life livelihood depends on it, I need to know when it changes so I can uh, make the appropriate adjustments. And a quick interlude, um, something I really like to bring, uh, bring up when people ask, are breaking changes really that big of a problem? Uh, Shopify has a really nice blog post detailing all of the things they do to make sure breaking changes aren't breaking anybody. So they um, they add metadata to things that change. They mark things as uh, breaking or possibly breaking. And in fact, for anything that is user impacting, they'll go out and do developer interviews um, if there's any ambiguity at all. And so um, I, I love this because it really demonstrates that um, I, when you have an API, you're in a developer ecosystem. If it changes, it's a big deal. And so what we need is for these planned gardens to coexist with the rainforests, but there are some uh, requirements. So first you need external APIs to have more planning. You can't just have them changing all the time without telling anybody. But what you want is internal facing APIs should be allowed to move faster. If you impose that kind of Shopify model on every single API, you've just thrown away all of the gains of actually working in an API-based, service-based environment. Um, but what we want now is a way to propagate organically evolved changes from um, these fast moving internal services and APIs to the carefully updated parts of the system. These parts need to coexist. And then we need a way to communicate these changes to human beings because they're the ones working with APIs. And so it might not be a surprise when I say, hey, we can uh, use API specs, not just for specifying things, but also for capturing behavior of implementations. And um, for anyone who hasn't noticed all of my Taylor Swift slides up until now, I will directly quote a Taylor Swift song. It's like API specs are saying, been here all along, so why can't you see? You belong with me. But there are already some API specs. So, you know, people are used to using them in their systems. API protocols were designed to be human readable and human editable. So this is a great thing to use more so than, you know, something else. Um, there aren't that many API protocols. So it is reasonable to think about mapping out your entire API graph via API protocols. Um, and so we thought, well, what if we could learn API specs to capture implement, uh, implementation behavior somehow? Um, would that be the bridge between this API first view of the world and implementation first view of the world? And so the proposal is that designing an API up front, that's still a great idea, API first, we're not throwing that away, but implementations usually deviate from that design and the spec should capture that. And implementation behaviors evolve in production too, and the spec should capture that too. And this spec, and maybe we don't call it a spec anymore, I'd love to hear from you your ideas on that, can be used not just for documentation, but for uh, ensuring production matches the spec, for understanding production behavior, for understanding changes, um, a lot of other things.
And so the question now, if we buy into this API in the loop view of the world, is how do we keep the API spec up to date everywhere? while maintaining sanity, because um, developers already aren't writing the specs once a lot of the time. How are we gonna make them updated every single time? And so I don't have that much time left, but at the end, I just uh, hope to show you one way of getting after the fact specs for testing in production. So I'll just show you really quickly um, what this can look like in Akita. So um, so I've put up a little Docker container with a test system called Akibox. Um, how Akita works is by passively uh, watching your API traffic through PCAP filters. So here I'm just invoking Akita to run on port 8080. I'm gonna generate um, a few API calls across port 8080 that Akita can watch here. And then um, the command line agent will be generating a spec. And so we can go here. Um, we can now see the spec here. But, um, but essentially what you get with Akita is um, I watch some traffic and now uh, I get information about endpoints. I can drill down into the endpoints to see the different fields. This is all from watching the traffic that I just showed you. So no annotations, the programmer doesn't need to do anything. Um, the engine is inferring argument uh, arguments like folder ID. You can go ahead and edit things. Um, you can filter and say, I only care about uh, parts of the spec that have email. You can um, you can create views over the spec. You can diff against another spec. Um, but for us, this has formed the foundation of automatically understanding um, what what your systems are, are doing in practice. And um, I'm, I'm happy to give anyone a longer demo if, if that's what you want. Um, but I'll just, uh, for now, give you a, a quick description of what you saw. And so um, what Akita does is it watches uh, API traffic in test staging or prod. You can anal uh, We analyze the traffic to understand endpoints, data types, and other properties of API behavior. And then we use these models for analytics, behavioral diffing, and more. And people have asked us, so yes, you can compare these two original handwritten specs as well. Although we found that um, we're still tweaking how to, how to make that work well. So um, once you have these after the fact API specs, you can explore them to understand endpoint behaviors, data types, and more. You can diff them against handwritten specs. You can diff specs across pull requests in canary deployments and more. And so people have been asking us about performance, data size, all these things. Uh, we're currently working on incorporating these into part of the, the spec as well. It's quickly becoming something other than a spec. Um, we just need to find a name to call it. And then you can also download these and use the YAML files anywhere you're currently using API specs. So for documentation, client generation, test generation, and more. Um, so yeah, uh, what I hope you take away from this talk is when it comes to APIs, we need both planned gardens and these organically evolving rainforests, but we also need some way to help the two coexist. Uh, characterizing what the implementation is actually doing is crucial for understanding these systems and also improving the designs. And so um, I'd love for people to talk to me about what you think uh, API in the loop could do, because I think this is the way to bridge the gap between API first, uh, testing and production, and, and all of the, the implementation practices that people are, are doing today. So I'm... Um, so yeah, that's all I had planned. Um, I'm happy to stick around and uh, talk to people in the chat or um, whatever forum people are hanging out on uh, after this talk. Thank you. Good one. Thank you, Jean. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the questions. I'm amazed that there aren't more questions about your Taylor Swift uh, fetish there, Jean. Um, you've escaped that uh, pretty cleanly, I think. Uh, but Kevin has a question. His question uh, is, do you think organizations are doing less testing overall or do you think that they are doing just as much or more testing differently, not in a single phase, um, not necessarily in a single phase of the life cycle? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question, Kevin. And thank, thank you for the question. Um, I don't think they're doing less testing. I think it's definitely shifted. And so um, initially when we started out with Akita, we thought, oh my gosh, um, you know, this wouldn't this be a great solution for everyone to run in their integration tests, in their unit tests, even before things hit prod, people can just understand everything about their system. And what we found is most of the testing happens in staging in canaries and often, you know, um, just very principled watching of production environments because um, unit tests, integration tests are just capturing less and less of what's going on. And then also, um, when we when we come across companies with a heavy front end, like one place they want to run us as well is like in QA. And so um, I think traditionally, especially like, you know, when I was in the university and we taught testing, it was very much about like, oh, you write your unit tests, you type check, you um, you write your integration tests. But um, but today it's, it's, you know, people are doing just as much because they don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night. Um, it's just happening in different places. And so the tools need to meet the people even more um, where, where they're testing today, I think. Yeah. Okay. I am curious, like we, uh, so I've got a large engineering team and we do bang on a lot about um, having a design first mindset. And often when we do it kind of back to front, all the dirty laundry that you have in the back end, all of those data nuances, you know, uh, even the, the naming standards, uh, the enumerations that you might use, et cetera, they kind of surface up and you have an API that when you look at it, you don't have to squint too hard to go, I know what's behind that. That's hitting a SAP system or a Salesforce right. or whatever. So we encourage our people very much to say, take a deep breath and think about the, the resources which this API is exposing, the state that those resources bounce through. Once you get the resources and the state, um, and you kind of jot it down, the API spec comes to life. It yeah. Happens but the downside is we tend to do that once. We do it when we build it, and then we throw it, you know, into the de delivery machine and it gets built. And even before we get to production, there are changes, and you right. go, oh, I've got this, and uh, that's a bit different to what I thought. And I, I agree with you. The, um, the spec doesn't keep up, and people don't right. go back that square one um, right and it, it's interesting because i think we don't have to call it a spec but you know that that like that process you just described we see over and over again and i've gotten yelled at by by spec purists for saying well the thing later that's not a spec that's some, something capturing your implementation um and my point is whatever that is um it'd be great to automatically update that thing because i am you know uh, like Ben, what you describe of your team is already more disciplined than most teams I encounter. And still, you know, there's there's so much that goes uncaptured. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I so I work for Deloitte and we're good at the projects and getting something up, you know, up and running and bring something to life. But that part of the software life cycle is very short when you look at the end to end life of a piece of software. The build is, you know, a couple of months, three months or whatever. And then you've got hopefully a few years of it, you know, Right. Uh, living and, and evolving. And I think our approach works for that initial instantiation and it's not so good for the 90% of the life cycle, which is... Yeah, yeah that, that's a great point. Also related to my... Um, <laughs> the essay I recently wrote about the case for developer experience because um, one of the points I made was um, so much of the focus on developer experience and tooling is on the first initial, how do you get the software up and running? But um, so much of what developers actually spend their time on is maintaining, uh, bug fixing, uh, responding to incidents and, and all that other stuff. And... Also, something we encounter is um, some teams show up to us and they just have a collage of um, tools from different eras of their organization. Um, and, and so I, I think the API in the loop or, or spec in the loop is, is something I, I'd love to hear more people's thoughts on for you know the, these realities of, um, of software. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, you can't rely on developer goodwill um, to keep these hygiene factors in play. Hey, there's another question from uh, from Raman. Um, he he's, says, sounds like observability is the name of the game, and there's a lot of talk about observability this year at API Days. His question is, does this also apply for the security part of API design? 
Um, absolutely. So when we um, when we started um, Akita, I actually thought that this would be a security focused company. So um, mm -hmm. when I was in research, um, one way you write your research grants is very much about who, uh, which government organizations care about your area. And a lot of programming languages work was bucketed under security because they assume that's who cares about correctness and things like that. Um, and so when I started Akita, I thought, you know, hey, we can use these kinds of techniques to figure out where um, where there's stray data and the API, um, we actually, um, we work with um, some security teams to, to figure that out. Um, something we noticed though, is that, you know, it, it seems like um, traditional uh, DevOps observability tools, the kinds that, um, where you use logs, metrics and traces to figure out what's going on. Um, it seems like that's been a different set of things than API security tools, um, which, um, you know, the traditional tools are like, we'll let you do anything you want um, uh, to understand your system. It's, it's sort of like the assembly language of understanding your system. And then the security tools have given like a kind of a light monitoring layer on top. Um, one way we see uh, some of the stuff we're doing is giving abstractions on top of logs, metrics, and traces, and security uh, questions are one kind of question you could answer with that, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does. Look, I'll, I'll finish with a really uh, a softball question. So Akita, uh, I saw the the picture. That is a our the Japanese dog. What where did the name come from? Oh yeah, yeah. well, so um in the beginning, uh, I'm not the best namer in the world. So I, I was talking to a few friends, like what should the company be called? And um we were going through you know like first like plants, and then we were in the animal category, and then we were like not no butterflies, no dolphins, <laughs> um, and then. Uh, we were like dogs. Dogs really convey, you know, loyalty, reliability, um, dependability, like very good values. So then we just started going through, you know, breeds of dogs. And as you can imagine, Akita was one of the top ones. Um, but then someone pointed out Akitas are great because of Hachiko, the, the very loyal Akita who was famous for waiting for his owner for seven years um, at, at the train station. And so after I heard that story, I just said, no, you know, we're done. We're done at the A's. It's going to be called Akita. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it sort of stuck. Yeah, I remember that story. I lived in Japan for a couple of years and at Shibuya Station, they've got, oh, wow, the, yeah. they've got the dog there. Yeah, that's a, a very nice story. Yeah, there's also an Akita museum now, um, by, and, and they have a replica of the station <laughs> in the front of the museum for oh, wow. uh, Akita lovers, yeah. No, good one. Well, I think we're out of time, um, but thank you again very much for being part of the event. Um, and I assume you'd be happy for everyone to connect on LinkedIn and to, to um, ask any Yeah, questions. absolutely. So this is um, obviously very short. So talk to me on Twitter, talk to me on LinkedIn, um, anywhere you can find me on the internet. <laughs> I'm happy for you to talk to me. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Jean. It's been great having you a part of API Days.